The Siskiyou Mountains of Southern Oregon and Northern California are no stranger to men in search of gold. The traces of old mining operations still litter the region today. There was once a time when these forests were filled not with the roar of I-5, but the grind of men and machines tearing into the earth. The Great California Gold Rush came and went between 1848 and 1855, but it was in 1923 when a band of three young men once again came looking for gold in the Siskiyou Mountains. But this time, they didn't come to mine. This time, they came to steal. The twins, Roy and Ray D'Entremont, were born on the 30th of March, 1900, followed by their younger brother, Hugh D'Entremont, on February 21st, 1904. The brothers worked together at a logging camp near Silverton for four months, during which time they began planning their heist. October 11th, 1923, the brothers set out to intercept the Oregon-California Express, Southern Pacific Train number 13, while it made its slow climb up the Siskiyou grade. This section of track is actually one of the steepest rail ascents in the United States. Standing there, you can see it for yourself. As usual, the train slowed even further when about to enter the tunnel, testing the brakes before the steep descent into Northern California towards its San Francisco destination. As you might have guessed, train 13 didn't make it to San Francisco that fall day. The brothers took advantage of the train's slow speed to hop aboard just a few miles north of the Siskiyou train station. They waited for the steam engine and the first three cars to pass before jumping on board undetected. Armed with sawed-off shotguns and a Colt 45, there wasn't a single one of them who wasn't prepared to kill. They found their way to engineer Sidney Bates and ordered him to stop the train while it was midway through the tunnel. Roy stayed to keep an eye on the engineer while Ray and Hugh went to the mail car, which they figured would hold the treasure. When mail clerk Evelyn Daughtery saw the terrifying armed men approaching, he quickly sealed himself inside the secure mail car. This wouldn't stop the brothers, though, as they also came prepared with some heavy-duty explosive power. Attaching a stick of dynamite to the mail car door, they took cover and Roy pushed the detonator. The whole tunnel was shaken by the force of the explosion, which was far more massive than the brothers had planned for. The entire end of the mail car was blown off, the complete contents of the interior incinerated, and the mail clerk turned to spaghetti. Additional rail workers had by this point become well aware of what was happening. Brakeman Charles Johnson came to investigate the source of the explosion, and in response was shot by both Roy and Hugh simultaneously. Despite the amount of lead that Johnson absorbed, he survived the initial attack, only to be put down in cold blood at the end of Hugh's Colt 45. <laughs> Roy and Hugh rejoined Ray and the engineer Sidney Bates and called for the fireman Marvin Singh to assist with separating the mail car from the rest of the train. This proved to be impossible, however, as the damage from the explosion made the car inseparable. On top of this, the slope of the rails made it impossible to get the locomotive moving again. The smoke within the ruins of the mail car was too thick for any progress to be made in searching for any gold or cash that might have remained from the explosion. It was here that the D'Entremont brothers realized they had failed. They would have to flee empty-handed. The brothers ushered Engineer Sidney and Fireman Marvin back into the engine, where both stood, arms up, waiting for the nightmare to end. Meanwhile, the brothers discussed their conundrum. Leaving either of the rail workers alive would mean witnesses who could identify them. With that, Ray shot Marvin Singh twice with the Colt 45, while Hugh blasted off the head of Sidney Bates with his shotgun. The brothers then fled the scene, dragging bags soaked in creosote behind them, hoping to throw off the scent of any bloodhounds. Meanwhile, another conductor ran to an emergency phone to alert authorities in Ashland as to what had happened.
The following search would become one of the largest in Oregon history, the first in the world to use airplanes, and the first ever to truly utilize the power of forensic evidence. Police later found the detonator, the Colt 45, and the creosote soaked bags. Search parties that spread out away from Tunnel 13 discovered a small cabin two miles south of the tunnel, where it was assumed the heist was planned. From the cabin, a wealth of evidence was collected which would eventually lead to the cracking of the case. Evidence from the crime scene in the cabin told investigators how the criminals had executed their crime, but told them nothing of their identity. A professor at the University of California named Dr. Edward Heinrich had previously helped Southern Pacific Railroads with solving some minor train robberies, and with no further leads, the investigators sent him the evidence. This was the early 1920s. Outside of some parts of Europe, the concept of forensic science was an alien one. It would be another nine years before the founding of the renowned FBI crime lab. Dr. Heinrich was a man slightly before his time, but nevertheless, it was a bold move for the police to turn over evidence to a civilian. The most crucial piece of evidence found by investigators, as it turns out, was not any of the murder weapons, nor the explosives detonator, but a pair of green overalls. Dr. Heinrich gave all the evidence a careful and thorough examination, but the overalls revealed the following as written by the professor. From a microscopic examination of the dust, hair, and fibers collected from the pockets, chemical analysis of the stains on the garment, and a study of the set of his garment, induced by wear, I am of the opinion that the wearer and owner was a lumberjack employed in a fir or spruce logging camp. I computed him, subject to revision with further data which might be found, to be a white man not over 5 feet 10 inches tall, probably shorter, weighed not over 165 pounds, probably less, Age between 21 and 25. When in city clothes, he is a careful dresser, neat in appearance, and has medium light brown hair. Complexion fair, has light brown eyebrows, well developed, and small hand and feet. Other details include the discovery of fingernail clippings in one of the pockets, through which Heinrich was able to deduce the suspect of being of fastidious habits. The employment of this D'Entremont brother was determined through the finding of Douglas fir needles and sawdust in the fabric, and his hair color was easily identified under the same microscope. Also discovered in the pocket of the overalls was a receipt for a money order, on which the name Roy D'Entremont was signed. The tiny piece of paper had gone unnoticed by police investigators, and was only uncovered under Dr. Heinrich's expert examination. This was obviously key evidence, and all three D'Entremont brothers were immediately suspects. Lending to further certainty that their murderous felons were indeed the D'Entremont brothers, a police interview with their father, Paul, confirmed that the three of them had been working as lumberjacks and that Roy was left-handed. Dr. Heinrich was also able to recover the serial number from the surface of the metal on the Colt 45, linking it to Ray. The brothers were as good as guilty. Dr. Edward Heinrich's methods of microscopic examination, chemical analysis, serial number recovery, handwriting comparisons, fingerprinting, all things you see in crime shows today, became the basis for all of modern forensic science. He was hailed in the media, which had been following this bloodbath investigation since day one, being called the Edison of crime detection and Wizard of Berkeley. Later the same year, the first crime lab was opened by the LAPD, its director, the previous Berkeley chief of police, August Vollmer, a man who had once been a student of Edward Heinrich. But despite this massive achievement, the D'Entremont brothers remained at large. Knowing it was them they were after was one thing, but apprehending them was another. It would take four years before there was any sign of them. In the meantime, state and federal investigators would spend a total of $500,000, which is six and a half million in today's money, in costs of searching endlessly and printing two million wanted posters in five languages. At the time, it was by far the largest and most expensive criminal investigation in American history. To this day, it remains one of Oregon's largest. First word was of Hugh, who had apparently joined the army and been stationed in the Philippines. This was back before criminal records were accessible via computer, so simply being abroad made hiding pretty easy on Hugh. But when he was transferred back to California, a fellow soldier recognized him from one of the posters as the notorious criminal he was. Just as the investigators were prepared to give up, they had their first man. 
Shortly thereafter, the twins Roy and Ray were recognized and picked up in Ohio and extradited to Oregon. All of them pled guilty and were sentenced to life in prison at the state penitentiary in Salem. The robbery at Southern Oregon Railroad Tunnel 13 went down in notoriety as one of the most gruesome crimes of the 1920s, becoming known as the Siskiyou Massacre. The opening scene of the 1949 film White Heat may have been inspired by the events. I've been showing certain clips of it throughout. Holy the treasury stuff! If you go to Tunnel 13 today, you'll find the site of the robbery very much intact. The tracks there are still used to this day, despite their still being ranked as one of the steepest in America. To the side of the tracks sits an old rotting building, presumably once one of the outbuildings of the Siskiyou train station, whose ruins sat here until very recently. It seems they succumbed to the 2017-18 to winter, leaving only a pile of scrap and timbers in its place. There's like a serious breeze. Yeah. As for the D'Entremont brothers, they're all dead now. Roy D'Entremont spent 22 years in prison before being diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1949 and transferred to Oregon State Hospital in Salem. He soon after went to frontal lobotomy and was rendered unable to care for himself. In 1979, he was finally transferred to a Salem nursing home where he got 24-hour care, which he required. In 1983, he was granted parole and died in June of 1983 at the age of 83. Hugh D'Entremont spent 31 years in prison before being granted parole in 1958 for good behavior and started work as a printer in San Francisco. The free world wouldn't see him long, though, as three months after release, Ray was diagnosed with stomach cancer. He would die in late March of the next year, age 63. Ray D'Entremont was the last of the three brothers to be released from prison, as well as the last one to die. He walked out of state penitentiary in 1961 at 61 years old. After release, he moved to Eugene where he took up work as a weekends janitor at the University of Oregon. He spent his time developing skill as a painter and studied French and Spanish. Then Governor Tom McCall commuted Ray's sentence after a personal plea to become a free man before his death. Ray died in 1984 at the age of 84. The story of the D'Entremont brothers is a story that sits on the cusp of our reality and the reality of old westerns. The early 20th century had saw the end of any traces of the Wild West. Boldly chasing down and carrying out a big-scale heist on a train in the mountains of the Deep West sounds romantic and thrilling, but in reality it turned out bloody and disappointing and it erased the lives of three young foolish men as well as the lives of those they shot dead. Between the 19th and 20th centuries, something changed about America that made such acts no longer practical. The change was inevitable. As more people moved west, what was once wild territory slowly was becoming tamed. If you wanted to rob a train, you suddenly didn't have hundreds of miles of wilderness to do it in and escape days before authorities could arrive. Now there was always a town within a couple miles of any place people or cargo passed through. This is why we just don't see any kind of hold-up style train robberies taking place in the United States today. 
That and the trains themselves have evolved a decent amount in their own way. Stealing from them just isn't going to be the same as it was in that time lost to 50s TV serials. The D'Entremont brothers, Wild West train robbers who tried to rob a train during the Roaring Twenties. When Ray was released from prison, a reporter asked him what it was like to be back in the world after so much time away from it. By this point, the man had been in a cell for 34 years. Ray responded, I'm trying to think of something to say. Well, you can imagine how it feels, can't you? But one thing is for sure. For the rest of my life, I will struggle with the question of whatever possessed us to do such a thing.